Welcome to Elementary Calculus. This is Chapter 1, Section 2, which is actually the first section that we're going to talk about this semester. And in this video, I'm going to go through some notes that a colleague of mine created, and we're going to talk about linear functions and applications. So this is going to be the format of what we're going to talk about is going to look very familiar to you. Um, here you're seeing y equals mx plus b. Uh, and then function notation is also in there. And that is what you know of as slope intercept form. And then after we work through this problem, we will look at an application problem. In other words, a word problem. And see how the slope intercept form, basically the linear function, can be useful to us. I'm a little embarrassed because uh, I'm recording from my office today, so I brought all my equipment with me from home, except for my Apple Pencil. So I'm going to do my best to write notes for you today with this pencil, and we'll see how it goes. Uh, future videos will have more precise writing, however. In this problem, we're going to find g of a minus 1, given this function g of x equaling 4x plus 5 and even though this expression inside the parentheses here says a minus 1 we were going to treat it just like it's a, a number which is what we're more used to and we're going to take that a minus 1 and we're going to plug it in wherever we see an x so there's an x and there's an x we'll replace both of those with a minus 1 so g of a minus 1 equals 4 times a minus 1 plus 5. Wow, that really looks like I'm a kindergartner. It's embarrassing. All we have to do to simplify the right-hand side of this statement is distribute multiplication by 4. So I'd like to write a little note over to the side that says DIST for distribute. That gives me a 4A minus 4. And we don't forget to keep the plus 5. And then we will combine like terms. There are no variable terms to combine. So the 4A is still the 4A. And the negative 4 plus 5 is a plus one, and I like to put a box around my final answers. So even if you can't read it, if you can hear me, I'm telling you, I promise, that says 4a plus one. So a little reminder of function notation, and then we're gonna take it and start applying it to cost analysis and supply and demand. And as we go along, if there are any things you wanna take notes on that I've slid off the screen, make sure that you pause and, and write some of this stuff down if it's going to be helpful to you in your course. This will definitely be beneficial to my students because uh, we're going to see vocabulary in an elementary calculus course that if you're not sure uh, what those terms mean, it's going to make it more difficult to answer the question for sure. Let's get the entire question on the screen. There we go. And we have a cost function, c of x, where m, which normally we think of as the slope, is representing marginal cost, and b is representing the fixed cost. And this is a linear function because our variable x is not being raised to the second power at all. It's just x to the first power. And the example says that we have a moving firm charging a flat fee of $45 plus $40 per hour. A moving firm or a, a moving company, I suppose, so C of X is going to be the cost in dollars. Sorry, my phone ringer was still on. Um, of using the moving firm for X hours. So X is being measured in hours. And we want to write this linear cost function that describes the situation. This is pretty straightforward. We have C of X, our cost function, and that's equal to, now we need our marginal cost, M, and we're going to multiply that by the number of hours that someone might hire the firm for. So at $40 per hour, that's going to be our marginal cost. 
we'll multiply that by the number of hours and then we have to add the flat fee that comes along with hiring this firm which is $45 and and that's it that is your cost function and certainly you could run into a problem where there's a follow-up question or a part B to this that says uh, if you're hiring the firm for a full day's worth of work maybe nine hours what would be your cost and you might run into yet another follow-up question where instead of giving you a number of hours an X value to plug in you're told that in a big moving project um, maybe it's uh, an entire classroom building or maybe it's an apartment complex where everybody had to be moved out because of uh, some sort of emergency or a flood or something uh, and the total cost of moving everybody out of the apartment building was twelve thousand five hundred dollars I'm just making the number up off the top of my head that number would go in on the left hand side of the equation and then the only thing that you would be solving for is X so you might be asked how many total hours were spent moving all of those residents out of their apartment building if the total cost of the move was whatever I just said twelve thousand seven hundred and fifty dollars another situation that we run into is where we try to find a balance we try to find an equilibrium and the equilibrium price of a commodity that's being sold and purchased is the price where supply and demand intersect and we like it when the demand for something is met by an appropriate supply so that everybody gets what they want as opposed to at the beginning of COVID for example where the demand for toilet paper was considerably higher than the supply so here we have two functions given to us the first one is a demand function D of P and the supply function S of P and P is represented uh, in dollars here and represents price in order to find the equilibrium price and the equilibrium quantity we're going to take these two functions and set them equal to each other so the the math of many of these problems is not going to be particularly difficult but making sure that you know how to set the problems up is going to be very beneficial because if you don't know how to get the problem started the problem becomes very difficult right off the bat so here I've taken D of P and I've set it equal to S of P and in order to solve this equation for P the first thing I'm gonna do which I usually do is move my variables over to one side of the equation so I'm gonna add 40 P to both sides that will get rid of the 40 P on the left hand side and it's going to increase this 160 P by 40 P leaving me with 4800 on the left hand side and 200 P on the right hand side and then in order to fully isolate our variable P we'll divide both sides of the equation by 200 so still with my great handwriting and writing with my index finger uh, we find a p-value of 24 and remember that p is a price in dollars so how does price determine demand and supply well imagine if uh, whatever commodity it is that we're talking about in this example problem if you doubled the price of something the demand's probably gonna go down if you're currently paying four dollars for a, a really nice cup of coffee a mocha or something whatever it is um, and you like to go and get one of the, maybe you go in and get a four dollar cup of coffee every day if the price of that cup of coffee were doubled would you still go and pay eight dollars for a cup of coffee every day maybe not maybe you'd only go every other day or Monday Wednesday Friday or something so the demands gonna go down um, and you can see that in that demand equation because it says minus 40 P so as the p-value increases that demand is going to go down now in this particular case maybe it doesn't make a lot of sense uh, my example of the cup of coffee because if the price goes up if the p-value increases would the supply equation 
really increase? Would our supply increase if the cost of the goods was greater? Probably not. So uh, that's not the perfect example here, but regardless, uh, it does give you a feel for for that particular this particular demand equation. All right. So find the equilibrium price. We did that, and then find the equilibrium quantity. You can find that by taking this p-value of 24 and plugging it back into either one of those two equations. And since my handwriting is on the low today, writing with my finger, I'm going to leave it up to you to take 24 and plug it into either one of those equations. And, and it doesn't matter which equation you plug it into because they're both going to give you the same result because we found our p-value by setting the equations equal to each other. The last little subtopic in this section is called break-even analysis, and this is very similar to the process that we were just going through in terms of trying to find an equilibrium price, except here, the equation that you're seeing right in the middle of your screen is the profit equation, and profit is found by taking your revenue, and sub which is the amount of money coming in, in other words, uh, the amount of money that actually comes from your customers and goes into the register. But then of course you have to subtract out your cost. And costs include things like uh, if you have a physical space like for a restaurant, uh, you have to pay for your rent, uh, electricity, running the air conditioning, you've got employees. There's a whole slew of overhead, especially when it comes to running a restaurant. So you do have to subtract those costs out. And revenue, here we're being told R of X, which is this equation here, is found by taking the price per unit and multiplying it by the number of units sold. And the cost function is going to be something that's very specific. Um, maybe it's going to be a fixed number. Uh, if I know that um, the only thing I'm doing is paying for a P.O. box, in order to run my business, well that number is going to be the same uh, every year or on a monthly basis. And the break-even point is found, again, I can't remember if I said, by setting the revenue equal to the cost function. We want the amount of money coming in to equal the amount of money going out in order to run the business, and that means I'm making no money. Okay, But it's important to find out when that's going to happen, because if I have to sell 500 bicycles a year in order for my bicycle company to stay in business, I need to know that. I can take 500, divide it by 12, figure out how many bikes I need to sell per month, maybe divide that even by four so that I can give my salespeople a goal of how many bicycles they need to sell per week in order for the company to stay in existence even. And that's just to break even. That'll keep putting money in their pocket because my employees are part of my cost function. The problem is, is that I'm not making any money yet because revenue minus cost is going to equal zero. So I'm not going to be able to keep a roof over my head. So I know that I'll need to sell more than 500 bicycles. And I'll try to motivate my employees to help make that happen. Because the business ain't the business if the business owner ends up living on the street because profit was equal to zero. So these are very important goals and, and little equations and ideas to keep in mind. Okay, the last example for this section says that the Midtown Delivery Service delivers packages which cost $1.70 per package to deliver. And the fixed cost to run the delivery truck is $84 per day. If the company charges $7.70 per package, so that's like if I'm sending a package to someone else, this company is going to charge me $7.70 to deliver it how many packages must be delivered daily in order to break even. In order to break even, we know that revenue needs to equal cost. Let's see if we can figure out a revenue equation. R of X. How am I generating revenue? I've got people paying me to deliver their packages. And they are going to be paying $7.70 per package. So I'll take the 770 and multiply it by the number of packages. The cost of running my business, my cost function, it costs me $1.70 to deliver a package. 
whether that's wear and tear on my vehicle plus um, some sort of a calculation to get the hourly rate for my employee, whatever it is, I know that I've got a dollar seventy, one point seven zero times the number of packages that I'm delivering, plus I have to account for that eighty-four dollars per day that it takes just to run my truck. I make sure those decimal points get in there. Tough to draw a decimal point with something as large as the end of your finger. And I've got a little notification sweeping in there. Sorry about that. All right, and then in order to find the number of packages that must be delivered daily in order to break even, we're going to set revenue equal to cost. R of x equals C of x. That is 7.70 times x is now equal to 1.70x plus 84. And all we have to do now is solve for x. So we'll isolate our variable first. Let's get the variables over to one side of the equation. Let's move them to the left-hand side. So we'll subtract, subtract 1.70x from both sides. That leaves us with 6.0x, or just 6x on the left-hand side, and that's equal to 84 on the right-hand side. Divide both sides by 6, and you're left with an x value of 14. I've put a box around my final answer again. Um, don't forget that, especially when you're working on a word problem, you want to kind of relate this numerical value back to the situation. So if you this were a free response question and whoever your teacher or instructor or professor is wants a handwritten answer that's in a sentence format, the answer would be that 14 packages must be delivered daily in order to break even. All right, thank you very much for joining me for this section 1.2 and I hope to see you in future sections. Thanks so much.